one more important decision which you have to take is what is the posterior extent of the incision in majority of the cases the incision should posteriorly extend in encompassing incorporating the parietal eminence in cases of trauma traumatic brain injury the flap should extend as posterior as possible to include the parietal eminence in cases of ischemic stroke the decompression area should be tailored to the margins of the impacted area allowing only the devitalized brain to bulge through the defect if there is extensive edema we tailor the incision in such a way the extent of edema is also involved is also included one more precaution is when you are taking the incision this this is the superficial temporal artery right so in majority of the cases particularly when the patient is lean you can palpate the superficial temporal artery so when you are designing an incision take the incision in such a way that you are going to spare the superficial temporal artery that enhances the viability of the flap third one what is the width of the flap and length of the flap one important precaution is if the width of the flap is very much small compared to the length of the flap suppose the flap is this way that is the width of the flap is very much less than the length of the flap this may compromise the vascularity of the flap can vas vascularity of the flap and can interfere with healing of the flap so we try to make the base of the flap as wide as possible if preferable if possible you will try to ensure that the base of the flap is at least equal to the length of the flap but may not be always possible so but we try to keep the flap as wide as possible this ensures that there is sufficient vascularity reaching the flap so that there is no necrosis so to ensure the vascularity of flap we take two or three precautions one we try to preserve the superficial temporal artery this is achieved by palpating the superficial temporal artery in front of the tragus second one we ensure that the base of the flap that is width of this is the base of the flap is as wide as possible once the incision is developed hemostasis is developed hemostasis is preserved is achieved done now now you will have to deal with the temporalis muscle we incise the temporalis muscle either with a knife i prefer to incise with a monopolar cautery along the posterior edge of the incision as shown in the picture once i incise this one once i incise this one i use a periosteal elevator to separate the muscle in this direction so i use a narrow periosteal elevator to separate the temporalis muscle from the bone this way while when you come to the attachment of the temporalis muscle along this line you can either use the same periosteal elevator to detach it along the line along, along this line or some people prefer to use a monopolar to detach it along the line if you are and remember you you can leave a small cuff of the muscle attached along the line which will help in the later stage to suture the muscle back if you are planning to place the replace the bone flap but because it's a decompressive craniectomy you are not planning to preserve the bone flap so this precaution is not so this precaution is not required and now the and now the flap temporalis muscle is reflected backward ensure that you are exposing the root of zygoma here and the anterior part of the root of zygoma here that is a frontal process of the zygoma where you place the key burrow once you retract the temporalis muscle you can hold the temporalis muscle with the fish hook but in our institute we prefer to take a uh, you know, take a bite take a stitch with 
silk, one zero silk, and retracting uh, with the help of rubber bands. Here, while here, try to dissect the pericranium carefully. Try to uh, keep the pericranium intact because this pericranium will later be used for expansor duroplasty. And when you are reflecting the temporalis muscle back to prevent kinking of the temporalis muscle and result in devascularization, to maintain the viability of the temporalis muscle, use a cotton roll so that there is no acute bend of the temporalis muscle. Coming to the placement of the burrows. We use a high speed drill to uh, place the burrows. So, they, so that the chances of entering or penetrating the dura mater are less. The first parole is the classical key parole. The second parole is placed at the root of the zygoma as lower down as possible on the squamous temporal bone. The more down, more towards the base of the skull you go, it's more easier to expose the middle cranial fossa. The third parole is about the mastoid. Do not open the mastoid air cells. Then the remaining burrows are placed along the frontoparietal region. This is the frontal bone. This is the parietal bone near the midline along the frontoparietal region. Ensure that these burrows along the midline are at least one and up to two centimeters away from the midline. This is a very important precaution. Because if you don't, if you place the burrows on the midline, there are high chances of injury to the sinus, to the superior sagittal sinus. Once the sufficient number of burrows are placed, a number three pen field is used to strip the dural attachments from the undersurface of the calvary. If there are many surgeons who, may, who, who will be able to complete the craniectomy with a single burrow, but I prefer to place these burrows so that at each burrow I use a periosteal elevator, a number three pen field to strip the dura mater from the underlying calvarian and also to some extent along my, my the line of craniectomy. This ensures that the dura is not cut while, during the, while you are elevating the bone plug. This is more important so in elderly people, and this is more important so at the level of the suture, like the coronal suture, where the dura mater is tightly adherent to the skull. At this sphenoid ridge, I drill the sphenoid ridge with a sphenoid ridge with the with a burr to make it papery thin, to make it papery thin. Once I have placed a burr hole, I use a uh, I use a craniotome. I used a craniotum to complete the cuts. So I have completed the cuts. Then a periosteal elevator or a similar tool is introduced along the posterior edge of the craniotomy. And it is used to elevate the bone from the underlying dura mater. This bone is properly placed in an antibiotic soaked saline. If you are planning to place it back in the abdomen, if you have planned to preserve it outside the body, hand it over to your assistant for appropriate to preserving technique. One important precaution which are going to take here, this is the sphenoid bridge. So you'll have to keep the bone, drill the bone to make it papery thin. When you are elevating the bone, this bone should easily fracture at the Sphenoid ridge. If it is thick enough, it's not getting easily fractured. Take additional time to drill it because if it's very hard and if you are trying to elevate it and if it causes a fracture, this fracture can extend into the base of the skull across the foramina like foramen spinosum or foramen spinosum causing injury to the meningeal arteries causing torrential bleeding, which is difficult to control. So, Remember to drill this one as papery thin as possible. Once you elevate the bone flap, this usually causes a demonstrable fall in ICP if you have already placed an ICP monitor. Now, this is an important step. 
This is temporal craniate for me. You can see why. You know that in cases of traumatic brain injury, in cases of infarct with midline shift, uncle herniation is a cause is, is an important cause of death. And uncus is a part of the temporal lobe. So you will have to decompress the temporal lobe effectively by completing the temporal craniectomy. I initially delicately using a dissector, I separate the dura mater from the remaining part of the spammous temporal bone until I visualize the skull base. That is the base of the middle cranial fossa. At this time, there may be an injured or a torn, uh, uh, torn meningeal artery, middle meningeal artery, which may bleed. So if it's torn and if it's bleeding, try to secure it with a bipolar, uh, with a bipolar cautery. Second one is, if when you keep up and when you try to separate the dura matter from the bone, there may be some bleeding from the epidural plexus. This epidural plexus can be controlled with the pressure itself. So you use a combination of abgel, surgical, and cotton oils to apply pressure over there and wait patiently until the bleeding stops. You can just pack it and continue with this remaining part of the procedure. Once this is done, you can use a nibbler, nibbler, this is the nibbler, to ronger of that bone to reach the base of the middle cranial fossa. If any air cells are opened, close it with abject and close it with bone wax. One important thing is, as I've told, I'm repeating again, the squamous portion of the temporal bone must be removed until flush with the floor of the middle cranial fossa. One more thing, if the mastoid air cells are exposed, bone wax should be applied completely so that there is no CSF leak later on. Now, opening the dura. While opening the dura, you should open the dura centimeter by centimeter or inch by inch. Why do you open it slowly? This is to prevent a sudden prolapse of the injured or edematous brain and to prevent sudden decompression. This sudden decompression can cause a tear in the venous sinus and cause bleeding. Second one, when you are taking the cut in the dura matter, when you are using the scissors, ensure that you are visualizing the under surface of the dura mater so that if any veins are seen so that if any veins are seen you can delicately separate it from the dura du, from the dura mater and this prevents injury to the various veins so in this way i complete the complete durotomy And after completing the dura, dura matter under vision, I take radial cuts in the dura matter so that I ensure that the convexity of brain is maximally exposed. While taking these cuts, I take these cuts under vision, preventing, taking all precautions not to injure any tributary going into the superior sagittal sinus or any vein going into the superior sagittal sinus. Once I've done my procedure, I complete the duroplasty. I will either use the pericranium, which I've harvested before. If I was not able to raise the pericranium intact, or sometimes the pericranium is badly torn because of trauma. In, this happens more frequently, traumatic brain injuries. I, in our institute, sometimes I use a layer of galia, inner layer of galia, which is a robust layer, to complete this duroplasty. And sometimes we also use artificial patches like G patches, which is easily commercially available in India to complete the duroplasty. There are also surgeons who will leave this layer, who don't close this dura matter. They place abgel over it, which forms a layer of the dura matter over time. O over time. This is surgeon's preference. I prefer to close it. Many of my colleagues don't close it. And when we see after three months, when you open it back for placing your dura matter, the abgel would have formed a continuous layer, layer over it. 
contrary to the common belief in our experience even if i do a duroplasty with the arm gel the incidence of csf leak is less so then then i place the uh, muzzle i uh, anchor the muzzle properly to the neighboring uh, uh, cuff of muzzle then uh, place a uh, close suction drain close drain without suction usually i place it without suction and then we close the skin in layers this completes the cranial part of decompressive craniectomy now if i am plan to preserve in the abdomen i take an incision on the abdominal wall the incision which i take is usually the right a uh, right lower quadrant i will explain you why i take preferably take the incision the right lower quadrant in cases of trauma or in cases of skin part if the patient requires a feeding jejunostomy that is usually done on the percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy peg which we call which we call peg that is usually done in the left quadrant above the stomach so if i place the bone flap on the left side this may come in my way of doing a peg endoscopic gastrostomy so i prefer to place it on the right and why in the lower quadrant i usually place it just parambicular umbilically so that the upper quadrant is at least slightly free because if the patient develops a post traumatic hydrocephalus later on i'll be able to uh, insert my uh, lower end of the shunt into the upper right quadrant then i with blunt dissection i develop a proper plane above the rectus sheath and laterally above the oblique muscles i insert proper hemostasis and place the bone flap with the convex surface outside if the patient is very thin and lean if i am not able to develop a sufficient pocket i can i sometimes divide the bone flap into two pieces and strike them one above the other but what is more important is once i place the bone flap there should be no tension in the skin when i close it if there is a tension in the skin the sutures may not heal and there are chances of necrosis if i am doubtful about hemostasis or as some of my colleagues usually place it we place it close suction drain i usually avoid a close suction drain so this completes our technique of decompressive craniectomy hope i am very clear as a neurosurgeon as a neurosurgeon you should be very adept and very rapid at this technique of decompressive craniectomy you have to until you are very sure very confident you have to do it under the guidance of a senior uh, a senior neurosurgeon and under, under the guidance of your professors under the guidance of your professors hope we will do the best for our patients uh, in the next in my next session i will uh, i will be teaching you one other emergency neurosurgical procedure and if anyone wants to contact me contact me on the whatsapp number which is there below